Race week again. Race week back again on Speed Street. We're going to Mid-Ohio this weekend. We've had a couple weeks off. Connor's been becoming a national television star with the SRX series on CBS. People have been loving that. Been sending us tweets, Instagram photos of Connor and his beautiful mug on there with Alan Bestwick. I've been somehow surviving the Lake of the Ozarks last weekend from a bachelor party. Uh, but we're back again. Huge weekend for IndyCar, huge weekend for racing, huge weekend for America. It's the 4th of July, people, and we're fired up. We're feeling good. I got the driver of the number 20 ride, Bit Nile ride, that is, in the IndyCar series. Connor Daly, my pal with us. Connor, what's up, buddy? You uh, you said you said it all. I mean, there's a lot going on. Great weekend coming up here, 4th of July weekend. Um, lots of motor racing took place over the weekend. Uh, SRX, NASCAR, uh, Noah Gregson got an incredible mullet and threw up twice in his car. Uh, <laughs> it was that because he was hung over or just really hot. I don't know. But, was that because uh, he was with deep move for two days or yeah. just because it was a hundred degrees? Yeah. <laughs> well, that, you know what? We won't, we won't comment on, on that type of situation, but we just know it was really hot. And those, those NASCAR drivers were, were out in the, out in the streets, uh, burning up out there. So, uh, so yeah, lots to talk about from there. SRX race was wild. Uh, Tony Stewart, I nearly thought was going to, punch a young man in the head, uh, Ernie Francis Jr. So there was a lot that, uh, a lot that took place and, uh, and we have a great guest for today's podcast as well. Tell us about him. Yes. Well, our guest is a, is a longtime friend of mine, uh, Mackenzie Johnson, uh, Mac J. Uh, I've known him since we were, you know, 12, uh, we were teammates in, in go-karting. Uh, he's from California, uh, San Luis Obispo, California. Um, he's he's produced an incredible amount of songs that you would you would know. A lot of club bangers. He still plays at nightclubs all the time. Plays at music festivals. Um, big in the electronic music scene. So uh, fantastic conversation with him that we have for you guys uh, coming up. But we also got uh, you know a lot of lots of, a lot of racing to talk about as well. Yeah, dude, it was. Um, it was cool because, you know, for people who are like, oh, well, you got a DJ on here? Well, this DJ, like Connor said, has a very, very diverse and lengthy background in racing, knows his stuff, knows what he's talking about, had a lot of really cool thoughts and opinions on stuff uh, in the autosport, motorsport world, uh, especially for people who are growing up in it, too, which is really cool. We'll get to that. Uh, but let's start off uh, recapping this crazy weekend, man, with SRX. Like I said, off the top, you're in the booth. Um, and, and there was a lot of, I mean, we got 4th of July coming up this week. There were a lot of fireworks this past Saturday night. Yeah, there was definitely, um, a bit more contact than the, than the first weekend. There was a lot of angry drivers. Uh, everyone was pretty tame week one in Pensacola. It was, it was actually very surprising, but as soon as they got into the heat races, then now this track was a little bit shorter and a little bit tighter. So, you know, to, to, to make moves on people, you really had to almost move them out of the way. And to be honest, like, I thought the racing was great. Like, there was a lot of fantastic overtakes, but, you know, some of it was mixed with contact. And um, we saw two great heat races, but also, you know, people that started to get a little bit angry in the heat races. Like, uh, you know, Paul Tracy was basically starting reverse grid pole for the, for the second uh, heat, had a great race going. And guess who? Oh, Paul in the wall. It was Elio Castro Neves. And honestly, like the, the feud between those two since the 2002 Indy 500, I mean, what, like, it, it's just like, this is the stuff that as a race fan, I'm like, I've always dreamed of this. Like I, like after being at the 2002 Indy 500 and knowing that Paul might've won, he thought he won. A lot of us thinks that he won because he passed Elio when it went yellow, but then Elio got the win and there was so much going on there that I, I, I love that type of drama. And Paul, Paul got punched around like a, like a punching bag, sadly, on the weekend. It was very unlucky. But, uh, but it, it, was, it, was, it was a fantastic show, I thought. Drivers getting heated. It, it, just, it also went to show you, like, it, is it supposed to be a show? Yes. Like, part of the reason SRX was created was to be entertainment. And that's why they do, you know, yellow flags in the middle of the heat races. They do things called fun flags, bring out the yellow, bunch up the field again. But these guys truly care to beat each other. Like Tony Stewart has not lost that fight. He's not lost that dog in him. Like he's, he's ready, to, he's ready to, he's ready to beat the crap out of someone because they drove him, you know, drove him into the wall. Old smoke's got plenty of smoke left in the tank. That's for sure, brother. And, uh, Paul Tracy on his Instagram, man, he was, of course, 
having a day uh, afterwards. We post the replay of Elio dumping him into the wall, says, all I'm going to tell you is that payback will come when it counts most. Um, then he he posts the screenshot. My man goes to screenshot of the text that Elio sends. Elio sends PT, dot, 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 my bad, dot, 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 <laughs> dot, 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 Elio with a gift that says my bad. Paul says, we've had our agreement, disagreements over the years. I do appreciate that Elio texted and called me last night to apologize. Uh, blah, blah, blah. We'll move on to the next race. Mental note has been taken, dot, 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 dot. So, yeah, which means absolutely nothing. He's still going to wreck Elio any chance that he gets. Like, <laughs> it's, not, it's like, oh, yeah, thanks, pal. But, like, I know Paul's fire is burning inside. Like, as soon as he sees Elio's rear bumper, Elio is not returning from the wall. <laughs> no, no. He's, Elio, you got to do – He's Spider-Man, and you're going to need to use all your webs, brother, to get out of the way because PT is going to be coming, that's for sure. All right, take us into the Tony Stewart, Ernie Francis Jr. Um, because I wake up on Sunday morning after watching bits and pieces and just having a time on Saturday night in the Ozarks, and I see – the first thing I see is Tony Stewart just manhandling by the, the, the shoulder and the collar of Ernie Francis Jr. So what, what was going on there, and, and how would you break it down on, on CBS? Well, it's really interesting because what I think a lot of people might not know about the SRX series or, or, or some, you know, oval racing in general, if, you know, if we watch NASCAR or if we watch IndyCar, you know, we have spotters, right? So spotters are very, very important. Uh, there are eyes and ears on the oval races. Um, and, and in SRX, there are no spotters. And, and I, after having driven the car, you know, the rear view mirror works and there's a tiny little mirror on the left side of the car that works, but like, it is very hard to see if there's someone to your outside or, uh, or someone alongside of you. So a, a lot of the times I think the cup guys are more used to that. Like from, from watching that race on Saturday night, you could tell that the guys with the NASCAR experience Got it. And they were and they were doing a little bit better than the IndyCar guys, especially when trying to move opponents out of the way. And, you know, sure enough, it was a it was a top, you know, the top three were all NASCAR Cup drivers at one point. Um, and, you know, I actually didn't even see the Ernie Francis and Tony Stewart thing, but I texted with Tony Stewart this week and he basically asked me, he's like, hey, is there anything you can tell those open wheel guys about not chopping people down out, out of turn two and four? And I was like, Look, man, I don't know. Elio drove me in the grass last weekend, so I still think he's not able to see much in general. So it was, it was, it was hilarious to see that. Tony is still, two days after he won the race, still upset with kind of how things were going. And honestly, like you have to look at that as, you know, he is an owner of that series, right? And he doesn't want to make, you know, he doesn't want to make all those crew guys, you know, bust their butts trying to repair all these cars because they're on a six week in a row schedule, right? So they don't have a ton of time to get things turned around. And, and there was a lot of crash damage. So it was a really interesting event. I didn't think it got too out of hand. Was there a lot of contact? Yes. But realistically, all the cars but two finished. You know what I mean? So, like, there, there's still, you know, there was still some great racing. I thought uh, the, the, the run to the checkered flag was great. You know, Tony Stewart versus Greg Biffle versus Bill, like Bobby Labonte. I mean, such a great you know, cast of legends. And, and, and I mean, I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, man, absolutely. It's uh, like you said, it's a six week sprint and they're going to be in Stafford, Stafford Springs, Connecticut at the Stafford motor speedway coming up on Saturday. And this is always a lot of fun because I mean, at least last year, uh, you know, you have IndyCar at mid Ohio, uh, 4th of July weekend. So you're, you're gearing up for the IndyCar race on Sunday and then Saturday night, I'm going to be out by the camper, uh, throwing on the SRX race uh, under the trees there at Mid Ohio, which is which is very very exciting. So looking forward to that. Obviously, Connor is going to have uh, some obligations of his own to where he won't be with SRX this weekend. He's going to be back at Mid Ohio. Uh, what are your thoughts on Mid Ohio, man? For the drivers, obviously it's a fan favorite. It's a whole lot of fun. It's a holiday weekend. Um, but for you guys, what do you think about? What do you have to look out for going into this race? Well, obviously, you know, we've been off for two weeks. So, um, you know, haven't been in the car for a little bit. Uh, there's been a couple other teams that have tested. You know, there was a there was an Iowa test. There was an Indy GP test. There was a Sebring test this week. Um, so a, a lot of, you know, a lot of different drivers have been doing, you know, some laps here and there and people have been working on stuff. Um, you know, we're, we're saving our testing for, for other venues. We tested Iowa next week after Mid-Ohio. Um, and, and yeah, so I, I think... 
in general, we just want to improve on last year. I think, uh, you know, we, a lot of cars, like I watched the qualifying session just last night to kind of re review it. And, and it's because it's a permanent road course, right? Everything's very, very tight. You know, you're looking for tiny, tiny time gaps. And, uh, and a lot of guys, you know, you look at some of the McLaren, like both the McLaren cars last year, you know, neither of them made the fast 12 and, you know, you at, they asked Felix Rosenquist, he's like, where was the time? He's like, I have no idea. Like mid Ohio is an interesting place where you have to get the tires switched on in qualifying. And, and by saying switched on, you know, in qualifying, you can go out there and think you have the best lap of your life. But when you get to the checkered flag, you're like, well, why am I seven tenths off the pace? And something in the car, something in the tire pressure, something in the track, the way you warm the tires up just didn't get the tires into the window of operating at the highest level. And so, you know, for us last year, we didn't do that, but my teammate was, what was successful in doing that. So it's kind of like, how do we evaluate what was going on there? You know, we've done a lot of simulator work just yesterday. We were on the simulator again for hours, uh, you know, trying to get, you know, trying to get a better package to bring to mid Ohio. And I think we've got some good things to try. So It'll be, it's a very, very competitive weekend. There's always some strategy that can be in play in mid-Ohio. There can always be some guys that start in the back that end up up front if there's any well-timed yellows. Um, so it's, it's, it's going to be a fun weekend for IndyCar. And, you know, we're back on, back on NBC again as well on Sunday, which we need everyone to be, you know, finally tuned into. But, um, but yeah, I, I can't wait to get back going again. It's, it's going to be a great weekend. We got Simone Di Silvestro again as, a, as our third car. And, uh, and she's been getting better and better. She tested at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway last week uh, at the Indy GP circuit. So, so yeah, there's a lot of good stuff happening for us. Yeah, man. It's, uh, I mean, last year uh, was my first year being in attendance at this race. It's an absolute blast, which is why I can't wait to get back there. We're leaving on Thursday, going to be out there uh, Thursday evening. But for the TV ratings, like you said, I remember mid-Ohio, I think it might have been the second highest rated um, race last year besides the 500. I think we were looking at over 1.5 million viewers, maybe close to 1.8 million viewers uh, on that holiday weekend there with the high noon start for Mid Ohio. So expecting big things again. Uh, was, where does Mid Ohio rank in terms of, you know, because obviously you have the, the straightaway where, where the checkered flag is and, and the green flag is uh, to start things off. And then you have kind of that winding curve, turn one, turn two. I feel like that is a danger zone there where it's real easy to get bunched up and push somebody off. I think Hinch did last year. Where does that part of this race course rank everywhere else uh, in terms of, oh, man, we got to get through this clean? Yeah, well, I think mid-Ohio is usually the best place for our race starts because when we start out of the keyhole, it's called down the back straight, you know, into turn four, everyone stays pretty bunched up. So, like, everyone's real close. Everyone's fighting for every inch of space on the track. Um, and there usually is some contact going into essentially turn four, but where we start and restart it's turn one uh, at the end of the back straight. And so, you know, it, 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 it provides a lot of opportunity, but also there's a lot of risk. So it's, it's somewhere where you really, really want to start up front because you don't want to get caught in the, in the, in the chaos. Um, but if you do, like I remember last year, you know, there were so many different strategies at play and we were actually quite quick during the race uh, which is encouraging. And uh, we definitely move forward. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's one of those places where, you know, you have to be perfect with everything. And I think like right at the end of either the race last year or the year before, like we almost ran out of fuel. Like we, we kind of made like one miscalculation and, and, uh, and we, we had to save a ton of fuel at the end of the race. So it's uh, it, it's, it's a, it's a wild place and, you know, home race for Graham Ray Hall. So, you know, Ray Hall has been testing hopefully like they, they really want to turn their season around here um, and you know, there's, there's a lot of people that are now, obviously we're halfway through the season and a little bit on the second half now. And, uh, you know, people are going to be starting to think about championship. Like, how do we, how do we place ourselves, uh, in the right position for this, you know, final, uh, the final half of the season. Yeah. You mentioned championship a couple of weeks off here, but just a reminder, uh, 293 sitting in first Indy 500 champ, Marcus Erickson will power behind him, new garden behind him. So you got two Penske's in the top three paddle award at four, Alex blow five, Scott Dixon, six, Rossi, seven, Felix Rosenquist, eight, Scotty McLaughlin, nine, and uh, Simon Pagano rounding out the top 10. Of course, you got Colton Hurd to creep in Connor Daly at 13. So a lot of guys bunched up there, but that's where we stand. Uh, with the IndyCar Championship standings heading into Mid-Ohio. Then after this, another week off, some testing for Connor, 
and then we get into Toronto. It'll be good to be back there for the first time in a handful of years. So it's really picking up, man. It really is. Um, anything else you want to preview about Mid Ohio before we get into Mac J? I don't think so for now. I, I'd love to get into this interview. It was it was a, it was a fantastic conversation. Um, and, and we'll also come back on the other end with, uh, you know, with a few more thoughts as well. Awesome. Yeah. Let's do it, man. Mac J here we go. All right. Well, we've, uh, talked about our guests that we're going to have on the show today. A very long time friend of mine, um, a former race car driver, but current musical artist, producer, DJ, um, really tall man, um, uh, Mackenzie Johnson or Mac J. Thank you, Mackenzie. <laughs> What's going on, guys? So to give everyone a bit of a background on like how I know Mackenzie, I started go-karting when I was 10. And a couple years into go-karting, we got into this uh, series called like the Rotax Max Challenge or whatever it was. And I that part of my career is a little fuzzy, but Mackenzie and I, I met Mackenzie when I went out west to race in this series, the Rotax series. And... We were teammates for like the Rotax Grand Nationals in 2000, I don't know, four or three, something like that. And so Mackenzie basically started out as a race car driver. And I don't know, Mackenzie, tell people where you started racing, how you started racing, and, and who got you into it. Got it. I got to adjust my seat for this one. I haven't told this story in quite some time. Um, yeah, so... I want to say it was 2014 for the Rotax Nationals. We were on Team Margay, right? No, not 2014, 2004, for sure. <laughs> 2004, 2004. 2004. Um, yeah, I got into racing. It was like a kind of like a hobby. My stepdad was into it. He was a, actually a guy that was doing motorcycles before he was doing carts, and it was a lot safer to do four-wheel and so instead of two-wheel. He hear it all the time. Um, it was kind of a hobby, but where I was located in California – it was the central coast where there was a, a racetrack called the San Maria raceway right next to the airport. So it was maybe a 30 minute drive. So that's what really made it, you know, easy for it to become a hobby. Then it turned into more of a hobby and how everyone knows racing is super expensive. There was a lot of good people against it in my family, but I was the youngest one out of three boys and I was the only one that wanted to do it. And uh, yeah, it turned into some sort of, crazy you know elementary experience traveling up and down california doing regional races club races then regional races then national races then the worlds all in karting so um it was a cool experience to kind of figure out how you know brains are developed as kids throughout high school and elementary school but with racing, it's so much different. It's because you get to be put into real world positions super early in your career, right? So it, if it wasn't for my racing career, I don't think I would even have a career in music, not just because a lot of the stars aligned, but more of the fact that it taught me how to shake the hands and kiss the babies, you know what I mean? And dealing with money and all of that. So long story short, yeah, we uh, got into racing that way. And then I met Connor when, when, was it the stars of karting? What was the series? Dude, I don't even, I don't even, I don't even know. Like it, it was so long ago, but I like me and Mackenzie have these hilarious photographs at, like in our little Margay racing cart suits. So bad. And I was like a chubby little, uh, <laughs> little fella. And Mackenzie looked like a lanky, like a, just a lanky kid with long hair. I mean, it, <laughs> it, it was so funny. And like that era, was like it was super competitive and and like i remember like you were obviously a west coast kid from san luis obispo and me being on like from the midwest like we didn't really necessarily cross paths a ton but we kept in touch and your like my dad was like befriended your family a little bit as well yep. and so you you basically kind of we kind of were on the same path though like like we were going towards racing cars and you had an opportunity to go into like into formula bmw right Yep. 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 That was, uh, that was kind of like the turning point. I won a, um, a scholarship program, won a scholarship program for, uh, it was the DD two. how I just remember that. That's crazy. It was the DD two at road America and, uh, Herbert Feld and Walker. And that was the formerly, formerly a BMW scholarship program. And it finally got me into, cause I never did skip barber. I never did the early open wheel stuff. I was just really strictly, um, wanting to do carts because my height was such a 
it was such an odd thing because you know, I was getting the extended chassis when I was 15, 16 years old. And did I really think I was going to have a career in racing? No, it was just so, it was one of those things where my parents saw the benefit of me being able to be social in a business setting throughout racing and being able to befriend. It was like basically a big fraternity in a sense with a lot, a young fraternity and a lot of good opportunities that just came from meeting the right people. And, you know, I got to meet you and it was a big relationship after that, but you know, doing the formerly BMW stuff, I tried my uh, my foot in the uh, more of the Asia market, and I moved to Macau for a summer, and I was on this team called uh, Your Asia, and actually Daniel Ricardo was my teammate, and that was uber competitive. Like, I don't think I've ever seen so much talent in a forty car field in formerly formerly BMW. And the reason why I did that was it was a lot cheaper than doing the U S series. And, uh, that was kind of it. Then I did like one or two races in formula Renault, tried a testing in a formula three car. And that was kind of the end of the career. The economy kind of crashed. I went back to the States. I was already into music at that point. And, um, the stars aligned with me doing music stuff. And I don't think I, like I said, I don't think I would have been at that point unless I knew how to, you know, asking for money for sponsorship. That's like one of the most awkward things to do, right? You don't learn how to do that when you're 13, 14 years old, but in racing you do. And that's something that only race car drivers and people that are in the sport of like auto sports. Yeah. Maybe some like endorsements and talent wise with sports and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, but racing has this like ability to make you hustle really hard. So it's kind of the the Mac J story. Do you, you, do you keep in touch with uh, Ricardo still at all? Yeah, uh, in a party sense. We see each other like once a year in Ibiza. And we're like, I'm like, you remember me? I still got the track record. And we always laugh about it because not a lot of people know this. Daniel, I mean, a lot of people do know this, but Daniel's a super nice guy. I mean, he's like one of the guys where on, he's the same guy at the track as he is the same guy in a restaurant as he's the same guy probably in front of his parents or at a nightclub. You know, it's, they're just genuine dudes, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. Now I will... I, I've asked Colton Hurd of this. I've asked Connor this. I've asked Jack Carvey this. A lot of people. I'm about to have a baby boy in a couple of months. First time dad. And so I've asked them, I want to know your thoughts now because those three all went on to be race car drivers and you're in a different field. Sure. If I wanted to get my boy into racing, do you suggest it? Do you not suggest it? For those people who are thinking the same thing as me, what are your thoughts? Open-ended question, right? It's... I'm going to say, I'm going to just, you know, the elephant in the room, it's how much money you got. You know, it's one of those things where I remember, do you remember, (laughs) do you remember Cole Witt? Uh, So Cole Cole was one of those drivers where when we would go to these races, doesn't matter if it was an IKF regional race, doesn't matter if it was a stars of karting race or, you know, grand nationals, any race, he would come in with an 18 wheeler. He would have four or five top carts. I think it was, he had the best mechanics, you know, X, Y, and Z he had, but then there would be some other kid that came out of the back of his truck and he had, you know, one motor, one chassis, he knew the track and he would just go school the kid. Do I think money makes racing relevant? I don't know if that's the right word. I would say, does it make the world go round in racing? Yes. First and foremost, if your son has talent and he's into racing, go with it. Because again, it's not just about getting him into racing. It's about the the actual atmosphere of meeting people and being able to do the hustle aspect of it. And you got to remember, there's opportunities like that never come about. So if you're able to do that for your son and put him in the right place, it doesn't matter if it was just club racing or regional racing, because if you see the interest that he wants to do it, that's something that a lot of parents don't have anymore. If you really think about it, you know, everyone gets a second place trophy in racing. You don't. So I would do it for sure. It's funny. You mentioned like all these names because that's kind of the era that we grew up in, right? Like Cole Witt, the name that you mentioned, he, he made it to the NASCAR cup series, like Daniel Ricardo, one of the most like very successful guy in formula one. Like that's kind of the era. And Connor Daly. Well, I don't know. That's, that's a little bit. <laughs> Connor Daly, dude, you got to remember that. You know, when you're racing in that series, everyone knows. I mean, it's like seeing the kids that go from high school baseball and you're always like, yeah, they're going to do it. 
you know, they have the height, they have the build, they have the strength. And you're always kind of like, yes, that's going to happen. But I know so many insanely good drivers that came from, you know, the whole stars of Cardi thing that would just whoop. They didn't make it because they didn't have that like inner hustle to go and want to make it. They just waited for the talent to get them through the door, which does not happen. And I learned that at a very young age, especially my parents were like, dude, you're too tall, bro. Like <laughs> when I'm in a formula car, I was turning. And every time I turn, my elbow would hit my, my sternum. And I'm like, yeah, this is not going to happen. At one point when I was in Asia, I was turning the stop the top of the steering wheel with my hand. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, this is, I'm like really, this is not going to work out. You know, Tell people how tall you are now. Six, I'm a six, five. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly, six, clearly, I'm just really lengthy. Like I have exactly. really long limbs. Cause I will, I will never forget you. Like you stayed at my house one year uh, when you came to test the Formula BMW car at Putnam park in Indianapolis. And like already then, I mean, you must've been a foot taller than me at the time. And I had no idea how you fit in that car. But again, that was for like Derek Walker's group, like folks that folks that know IndyCar, like Haberfeld and Walker, that's Derek Walker. Like we all know Walker, like Derek Walker was on our pit stand a couple of weeks ago, helping call one of Ed's races. So it's, it's a really small world, this racing world. And I, I always find it fascinating. Like it's, it's a conversation that like, whenever we're now hanging out, whether it's at one of your gigs or whatever, People have no idea. And we just start going off talking about racing and people are just kind of like looking at us like, well, I have no idea what's going on here. But like, it's only something that like we experienced. And it, it's kind of something that you like, you probably will never forget because there were a lot of great times. Like you raced against some incredible people. And I mean, it's just, it's a very unique way to, I guess, grow up. I'm the guy that's able to talk about it. Yeah. With my friends later on in my life. That's all I ask for, right? Like being able to just have those memories and keep them alive. Like I haven't said stars of carding or DD2 in probably 10 years, right? <laughs> yeah. Again, it's, you know, go, Joey, to go back to your question, I really do believe that if you're able to, it doesn't matter if it's baseball, football, soccer, those are the sports where that's a community, right? Racing, like Connor said, racing is so small knit that you don't, excuse me, you don't know if, you know, one guy is going to be your business partner in 10 years, right? Because everyone wants to have a relationship in racing because they're all about the sport. It's such a different, it's a different mentality. Like my stepdad still races. He does like the 24 hours of Thunder Hill. He does like the like stock specky 30 stuff. And he's still friends with these guys that he's been racing with his whole career, 30 plus years. And they have the barbecues, they do the whole get down every weekend, right? That is so much more important than going, ah, I need to, I need to make friends or I need to do X, Y, and Z to get a trophy in my room. No, it's the relationships that you build in racing. So I would yeah. say go for it. No, we're, yeah, we're, I mean, this weekend is mid Ohio. Um, and that is, you know, famously a camping community, uh, you know, track and, 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 and an event in itself where I'm going out there camping the whole weekend my family, our friends, we're doing it. So I hear you there. Um, do you still follow what's what, you know, do you follow formula one, IndyCar, NASCAR, you keep up with it all? I follow, I follow IndyCar because of Connor. I follow IndyCar a lot. You know, it's keeping up, keeping up with Mr. Daly here. Um, through other racing, other racing stuff. I was really, I mean, formula one is one of those things where of course I've been into it my whole life and that was always the goal you know, but I feel like since, you know, speed TV and a lot of these other carriers haven't really been able to hunker down on carrying a lot of auto sport stuff, it's fallen off big time for me in the States. And I used to race cars and I would still go out there and like try to find it on TV. I mean, shit, sometimes I'll be in the airport and see go-karting on. I'll be like, what the hell, you know, like on these random channels and you know, I want to follow it as much as possible, but of course, you know, there's formula one, there's Indy car, you know, I never followed any of the cup stuff. I started following it because of Jaskel, Matt, or yes. uh, Matt Jaskel was a guy that also lives in Vegas and he taught me how to skydive and I've known him for 15, 20 years. And, you know, following now his trajectory, he's a little bit older, his mid thirties and following that. So I'm basically following racing for my friends, which I love, you know, so yeah, yeah. that's yeah, and that, like, 
that, that's why we do it, right? Matt Jaskell obviously now has a couple truck starts underneath him, a couple Xfinity starts. Um, so I, I kind of want to get into how like the musical transition, right? Because like I, I think I had my very first nightclub experience with you, like when I was 21 in Chicago in <laughs> oh, yeah, some yeah, yeah, nightclub. Yeah. You remember Timmy that? Sister. Yeah. yeah. Wow, so you created this monster. You, yeah. It's your fault, Mac J. Dang. We have great, <laughs> great photographs. The first time I'd ever been in a DJ booth, it looked like it was built out of like cardboard boxes, but it was quite a nice, quite a nice venue. And I mean, I, I thought it was super cool because like I love music and I like and I like the music that you're in, right? I like the electronic music. I like, I like the whole scene of kind of where you've gone. Like going to ultra music festival with you or whatever it was EDC in Vegas. Like that was one of the coolest things I think ever, because like that stuff is like the stuff that I enjoy. Like I listen to. So like you've obviously done, you've worked with a ton of artists. You've, you've produced a ton of songs, songs that like people they're played at every stadium. Like they're played at every sporting event. Like I feel like, and, and people were like, Oh yeah, we definitely know that song. You know what I mean? And so like, what was your, what was your transition? Like where, like, did you have to start playing weddings? Did you have to go from, you know, cause I think to, like still to this day, you're one of the most talented, like actual DJs with records, like scratching and, and like actually doing that, which is so cool. Thanks dude. Yeah. I mean, it all started back in my hometown. Uh, I came back from Asia. I went back to, I was in a community college for a bit. I got my G's done. I transferred to Cal Poly and um unfortunately my parents they couldn't afford my my tuition at cal poly so i needed to make ends meet and uh my buddy was a dj and i overheard him in a conversation saying oh i made fifteen hundred dollars this weekend dj and for uh you know an 18 year old kid going all right maybe i could figure that out because i was going to nightclubs in asia it doesn't matter how old you are it's you, if you're over this height you're good <laughs> and so I was going to clubs in Asia and I got to kind of got to see the scene a little bit, maybe once or twice a week. And like, I was able to figure out what the, not the art of DJing was. Cause again, I have never done it before, but like the idea of being able to crowd control of play a song and being able to know what the crowd's going to do. And if they're not feeling it transition, cause that's what DJing is. You're, you know, you're a paid jukebox to figure out what the room is like anywhere in the world. So came back to the States, couldn't pay for college, started working at this deli and I was able to make like 500, 600 bucks. And I bought some turntables off the same guy that told me he made $1,500 at a high school dance. And, um, I started just doing the hustle mentality. This also came from racing. It was knowing that, you know, following up with people kind of being pestering, trying to look for sponsorship. But for me, it was trying to look for, for gigs. And one of the very first shows I had was at Segep. And it was a, uh, they had a fraternity satellite house. And the girl that I was like hooking up with at the time was like, Hey, you should go and play for my friend. Who's the chairman at Segep. I'm like, I'm like, I'm going to have a show, you know, uh, not really, but you know, a lose, lose situation. There. Lose, lose situation. <laughs> I had the stuff. I had all the DJ equipment. I had some speakers. So I was like, fuck it. Might as well. So I got in my car. I drove down to Segep again. San Luis Obispo is like indie. It's just so small. There's only so many places you can do things. So I go and I ask the guy, Hey man, can I play your show tonight? And they're like, no. And I'm like, I'll do it for free. And he was, he had to think about it. And he's like, do you have your own equipment? I'm like, yeah. And I said, but if you like the way I play, you have to promise me three other shows at my rate. And he Is was like, baby? <laughs> yeah, just dude, just playing roulette. And so after that, he was like, after the show, he let me play and they contracted, they con contracted me on a, a friendship thing for three shows. And I started doing stuff because they knew the benefit of being able to just call me and say, Hey, we want you to play this sorority uh, exchange or formal. And these kids pay a lot because it's not their money. It's their parents' money. Right. So they don't care. But if they think that they're getting a deal comparable to like, there is this company called obsession entertainment and they were the ones that were booking all the colleges and I was lowballing the shit out of them. So they would book me, not obsession, but the fraternities because I was just lowballing the shit out of them. So they booked me. And after like the fifth or sixth show playing for Segep only, um, 
I was like, hey, I will play for four years in college, my tuition, if you pay my tuition and pay for my housing for four years. And they did the math and they actually made money on me. So they paid for my schooling. They paid for my housing. They paid for my food and I never had the pledge. So I got a free four year ride from Sagep. That wow. was what I learned. That is what I learned from racing. I learned that everything is, everything is the map. Tell me one thing that's not negotiable. There's it's not true. one thing, right? So after that whole thing, I moved to LA. In between my years of college, I was doing a lot of edits and making other stuff for DJs. Went down to LA, started opening for a guy named DJ Am. Did not who know who he was, but he was the biggest dude at the time. And everyone's like, oh, you're in good hands. I'm like, I don't know who this dude is. And then he took me under his wing and kind of just went from there. And um, kind of long story short, I learned how to produce music while I was in LA. I went to a school called Icon Collective kind of turned the page for me it was like me getting my like fia driver's license right it was like that turning point for me and then um that was it i kind of made i got some lucky songs i did well played uh, played every festival i'm 32 now and living in vegas sounds like a dream man you get you get a scholarship to be a dj to go to college now you live in vegas like you said um i want to talk about two songs of yours uh let's get fucked up and party <laughs> till we die um obviously uh of course your friends with connor daly uh making those two songs uh and myself now um but what do you think is better what's the better party anthem what's the better thing to say hey let's get fucked up or hey let's party till we die not even talking about your music just that saying let's get fucked up you have to censor it half the time right because you don't know who you're going to say it to so we little john and i called the song Let's get turned up. Funny story though, that song came out one week before Turn Down for What. Oh. So it was kind of like a, a de the devil's advocate. I'm like, bro, why would you do that to us? You know, this record is really, the record still turned out to be really well. And I mean, like Connor said, you can go in any club and still hear that stupid song. You know, shout out to every single DJ that still plays that one <laughs> song. But it's wild, man, because like when I look like in, in 2000, like 2014 seemed like I, when I go to the Wikipedia, seems like a solid year, like one of the top oh, 10 artists to watch at Ultra, like you were number 63 on the top 100 DJs, like for DJ Mag. I know people, they always kind of, there's, there's always interesting thoughts about that list, wow. but, but still like, and then Countdown with Hardwell, like that was number one on Beatport in like less than three days. So like you've had some absolute bangers and I feel like at any time... It, it's interesting to know because I feel like, you know, some songs purely by the artist, whereas like there's your songs too. And I'm like, I know it's you, but I feel like there's people just know that song. You know what I mean? It, yeah. do you, do you feel like it's, there's, there's like a, you're, you're pretty proud of that connection or you like think that there should be even more like, Hey, that's, that's mine. You know what I mean? Well, you, every artist, doesn't matter if you're, you know, uh, a creative person or even like an athlete, it, it, you, everyone has their own sense of their ability to, to be their own athlete, creator, artist, right? For you, you have your own driving style, right? So for me, when I was making music, I was really obsessed at that time. I would say 2011 to 2013, I was really obsessed of making very aggressive style club music because that's all I knew. I was only playing nightclubs. I knew it worked. I knew what people had to get moving on a dance floor. And at the time, there really wasn't a lot of EDM that was in the States. It was like LMFAO and, and like Afrojack song um, Take Over Control was just getting on radio. And so EDM was like in a very like weird moment, right? So I kind of was in a special time, you know, timing's everything, especially in the DJ community now or just the music in the industry in general, that my music came out in such a pinnacle moment that it was the only thing that DJs were playing because it was the only thing that sounded like that. Right. And so for me, that's what I, my lucky break was my aha moment was being able to just make the same songs, but getting different vocals and doing it. I always say what Mac J style is in every interview. I always say it's the backyard barbecue shit. It's like, you could go to a tailgate, you could go to a frat party. You could go to a club in the middle of sh asshole nowhere. And they would always still be playing my music because they know it works. That's all I care about. So anytime I can have any 
kind of stamp on my creativeness by showing that, oh, that's a Mac J song by the way it's arranged or the way the sounds are placed. It's like you, everyone knows Connor Daly's driving style. It's like when a team takes you on, they know that this is the way Connor drives. It's the same thing for me in music. How many times do you, you probably don't get very many like requests, right? You like people coming up to your booth, do you? They're, people are so like pushy now. It's mind blowing. Really? Okay. Um, dude, I don't care. It doesn't matter if I'm playing at, you know, the most exclusive nightclub or like the biggest festival. There'll still be that stupid person in the crowd having their phone that says, play, play something, you know, like it's funny. And because about the phone thing, yeah, it's uh, what was what have I been getting lately? Uh, I've been getting a lot of uh, God, what is his name? Bad Bunny. Oh, like every it doesn't do it. It doesn't matter if it was Joel playing. He'd still get it. It's like people are so entitled about, oh, I paid a ten dollar cover. I get to say what you play. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it, I, I equate that to like going up to me before the Indy 500 and saying, Hey, I actually think you should take turn one in third gear instead of fourth. It's like, yeah, I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe no, it's, it's like, you can't, tell, <laughs> you can't tell someone how to do their job. Like you cannot go into like their arena and be like, you know what? I think I know best in this scenario. <laughs> so my biggest thing was for the longest time, I've, I've always kind of played like, you know, stupid in this situation. When someone requests a song, I'm like, I can't read. <laughs> but now it's like they will legitimately, someone will legitimately come up to me. Shout out to everyone that comes up to me. Just fucking, yeah. <laughs> They'll come up to me and like pester it until they hear it. And you know, maybe nowadays it's a lot easier and a lot more, you know, acceptable to say yes to a lot of things, I guess. But it's always been really funny to be playing at these massive shows and seeing like even a, a, a grant, like a Zed play, right? I've seen Zed have to do birthday shout outs. Oh, and I'm like sitting here. I'm like, how much did you get paid to do that? Yeah. You know, <laughs> Who, who's worse Who's worse about requests, frat guys or sorority girls? Sorority girls won't say no. They will, like, <laughs> no is not an answer. Especially <laughs> when they have five white claws in them. It's like, yeah, right. <laughs> not happening, man. Yeah, it's my one of my funniest request stories ever was I was playing out of residency at Dre's here in Las Vegas. I was there once where we were there. <laughs> that was that, I mean, dude, that club used to be so fun. It had like the best view of the whole. Yeah. So Floyd Mayweather had a fight that night and he came in the Dre's and I knew they knew that he was coming in he had like five or six tables and it was slammed. It was really fun. It was like 2014, 15, uh, 15. And I don't know who he just beat, but he won a ton of money as always. And one of his handlers comes up to me, this big old bozo guy comes up to me <laughs> and he goes, I need you to play Floyd Mayweather's theme song. That's all he said to me. And then he walks <laughs> up and I'm like, all right. So my manager at the time, his name is Ryan. He's on his phone and he's like, I need an aux cable. I have it. <laughs> he plugs it in. I like do the most ghetto transition one of my buddies is a really good MC, like Bruce Buffer. I'm talking about, he probably could take Bruce Buffer's job. Uh, and he gets on the mic and he announces him and he plays a song. Floyd comes over with me with a stack of hundreds. It was a stack. It was a $10,000 stack. And his handler goes, good job. This is from Floyd. And he hands it to me. Ah. I'm like, Woo! It was by far the only time I've ever gotten paid more than 500 bucks to do a shout out or a theme song but it was just like hey he appreciated that i did it he did it in a more of a respectful way by sending some of one of his handlers to do it you know? <laughs> like, it was a it was a bizarre experience that's definitely vegas for you wow so now whenever a sorority girl or a girl at a festival with a flower headband tries to come up to you you can be like hey are you floyd mayweather no <laughs> and you have ten thousand dollars no sorry and then, can't do it <laughs> and then they go who are you? I don't even know who you are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Been That's there, great. done that, my friend. That, that, <laughs> that might be one of the greatest. I, I did not know that story. And that's that might be one of the greatest stories that I think I've and ever heard. From DD2 to Floyd Mayweather, my friend. <laughs> so so what so now obviously, you know, we're we're in our 30s. We're a couple adult, you know, a couple adult gentlemen. What's like what's your 
like what's your next goal like what's what's next for you like you're obviously still coming out with great music like and still playing shows but i know like personally i know that you're not necessarily like into the wild tour schedule like it's not a crazy tour like you've got an awesome spot in vegas and you play a lot of golf but like what's like what's what's kind of next for mac j um weirdly a lot more than i wanted it to be which is not a bad thing like i can't complain that i'm you know as mac jam still really busy and especially now with all the borders opening back up especially asia that's my market for sure um i've played everywhere throughout covid in the states and doing a lot of different things and like you said the tour schedule for me is a bit rough travel now is just hideous it's just like one of those things where yeah we have the benefit of being able to like choose we have status on an airline or, you know, we got clear TSA pre like these small things you learn, they're creature comforts that you learn traveling. You know, we've done it for X amount of years. We know what makes us a lot more practical. Right. Um, Minus that travel just sucks. I'm getting older. It's really hard for me to like do these late nights, early mornings, you know, it's uh, through COVID. It was really wild. I, I, I figured out kind of my, my uh, health routine and I work out basically every day now. And it, it's one of those things where I try to just make money while I'm sleeping. That has been like the goal since day one, you know? And so my mid thirties was the, the, the time where I really needed to reevaluate what I wanted to do in music if I didn't want to tour. And I, I produce for a lot of other guys. Do I like doing that? Yeah. It's fun because a lot of the music that I make, I really necessarily can't not, put out for me so that kind of opened up my brain through COVID to start producing and making another project so I have another side project that's fully touring it's it's great um it's all the mystique no one knows about it which is the best part they know not a lot of people know it's me um you know but I'm the guy behind the scenes I have people go on the road and do it you know I don't need to be on the road full time and doing the hustle and grind and eating Chick-fil-a three times a week like my body cannot do that. I just physically cannot do that anymore. I have one beer and I'm hungover. It's like wild now. Um, but yeah, I'm into sneakers now. Like, you know, Johnny, him and I have opened up 19 sneaker stores, you know, which is great. Um, massive through COVID. I was really big into currency trading. That's what was really wild for me. Um, but, you know, just dibble dabbling just trying to, you know, see what's right for me. I want to have a family here pretty soon. You know, I maybe should start getting a dog first and figure that one out. But um, yeah, make money while I'm sleeping. Never really lose that hustle mentality that I learned from racing for sure. And that has kind of kept me on my toes. There's always those moments where I'm kind of like, well, what's next? I was just in Japan for a week. Then what, Mackenzie, you need to relax, you know? So there's just, there's just a lot, you know? I, I, until my youth is gone, which it hasn't, it's weirdly, I've been, this is the most healthiest I've ever been until my youth is gone. I can't sit here and complain about anything. That's the biggest thing because I see too many artists go, well, it's hard, but I'm making X, I'm making more money in one show than someone's full salary paying job. Like, don't be a bitch. Just go do it. You know, like, there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot to be said with that, but it, it, it does get hard. I mean, Connor, you're a perfect person to talk about this with it's not just all it's smoke and mirrors, dude. It's like people think that this lavish lifestyle of being a pro athlete or, you know, being able to be on TV every single weekend, dude, it sucks. It's, it's, it's fucking hard, man. Like having to put a smile on and being able to turn on your, cause I'm very, I'm very introverted. Like I'm a guy that sits behind a computer all day. You know what I mean? And make music and make really annoying songs. It's like, it takes a lot out of you. So being able to, for me going to shows for Connor, it's going to, to, to the races, turn it on and being like, I have to be this really nice guy. You know, it's, it's, it's a hard switch to turn on sometimes, especially when you're tired and have diarrhea and been fucking eat chicken for five times a week, dude, it's not fun. So yeah, that's what I've been up to. Man, I, I, this has been fascinating to get to talk to you, man. I've I've, I've really enjoyed that. I know <laughs> that's that we, a good thing. I hope that's a good. Oh no, yeah, I've I've learned a ton. It's been very entertaining. I know we need to get you because have you you haven't done Snake Pit, have you? We need to get you out there. I'm probably doing it next year because the guy that books it used to be my tour manager, which is crazy. Chris Schroeder, shout out to Chris. Oh yeah, Schroeder. good. Yeah, yeah. I, so the funny thing Please. about Mackenzie as well, like the tie into IndyCar. I actually asked IndyCar, like they asked me. 
if I knew like an artist that would want to help produce like a song for their like oh yeah, about that. yeah, yeah, yeah. so Mackenzie did I don't, I don't know what it was like two years ago or three years ago that that song Drive to, it wasn't drive to survive it was like it was there was a lot of Alexander Rossi on it. That's all I remember. Yeah, it was like the, it was basically <laughs> like this, whatever campaign IndyCar was running, mm -hmm. they used his song, Green Light. And so like a lot of people did, didn't really know that, but like he's definitely been connected to IndyCar. He played my Indy 500 after party this year. We had a great time. He had a lot of Capri Suns there. And, <laughs> uh, and yeah, it was great. That's, That's awesome. It. Well, Snake Pit next year. Let's go. I love it. Yeah, it's, it's weirdly, it's probably either going to be me or it's going to be my side project. And if the side project... I'll for sure go do it for that show because I know how why. And to be honest, the side project, I wear a head. It's a, it's a helmet project. So there will be no sunburn on this face, dude, because I saw way too many sunburns this year after Indy. I show up on Sunday and I was walking downtown and every single person looked like they were just in the sun for 15 days straight. <laughs> I'm like, hey, yeah. Just beat, <laughs> just beat in the sun. I was like, welcome, ah. to the Indy, welcome to the Indy 500, baby. That's what it's all about. <laughs> <laughs> Bud Light and Sun, dude. I, uh, I really appreciate the time here. I don't want to, I told you 20 minutes and we went a little bit over that, but, oh, uh, good. but I appreciate it, dude. Honestly, great conversation. Um, appreciate the fact that you keep up with IndyCar still, because this is a fairly IndyCar centric podcast. Um, but yeah, we appreciate the help. We appreciate the, the, the questions answered and like, and good luck with everything, dude. Yeah, I appreciate it, guys. Connor, always a pleasure. Awesome. Thank Great you. to meet you, bud. Yeah, thank you, guys. Um, it's been a pleasure. It's been fun. IndyCar is uh, racing. Going back to it, man, like racing to me is – there will be no other sport that could have taught me that much. You know, if I can end with something, that's what I would end with because I meet a lot of guys here in Vegas that had a race like Ben Bostrom, right? Big moto GP rider. And, you know, had his whole thing on, on all the sports channels and was an announcer and did that whole thing. And he always says the same thing to me. He always goes back and going, if I didn't have racing, A, I wouldn't have kids because he's married to Nikki Hill, who the dad was the mechanics gloves dude. And there was also that, you know, just personal life aside, the idea of being in a sport where, yeah, it's competitive, but the competitive nature always brings the best out of you. And it also brings the best friends and the best relationships throughout your life. So that's one thing I could say about racing. It's like, I would not be here if I wasn't for racing. for sure. Love that. <laughs> better than that, bud. So there you have it. An incredible conversation with, uh, with Mackenzie, a long time friend of mine. Um, honestly, he like sometimes when you, when you, I guess, grow up with someone, or let's say like a lot of the drivers that I raced with growing up that are now in formula one, right. It's tough to, like who, who are going to be those guys that like still keep in touch with you when they make it big. Right. And I, I think of McKenzie as a guy who has truly made it big. Like he is, does songs with huge artists that, that you, everyone knows and plays massive music festivals. You know, I, I remember riding in a helicopter with him to the electronic Daisy carnival EDC, uh, EDC Las Vegas at the Indian or at the Las Vegas motor speedway. So you know, and I find that so cool because I love that industry, but just such an honest conversation about how racing, um, you know, how racing has affected his life. And, and a lot of like, a lot of the people that I want to have on this show as well in the future are going to be people that you might not think have a background in racing. Yeah, no doubt, man. I mean, that was my first time conversing with him, meeting him, super down to earth guy. I mean, when you're making songs with Lil John and you have a residency in Las Vegas, I mean, as a DJ, it's it's pretty much it. You know, you've 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 pretty much made it, and he has. So, and he was really. I mean, what's funny is that I I've talked to three professional race car drivers. Like I said about, hey, you know, my son's coming. You advise getting him into it, and all three of you have been very hesitant. I don't really know. The one guy who's not a professional race car driver who grew up in racing was like, yeah, I think you should. There's a lot in there. So it's just funny how. <laughs> The different experiences uh, play out like that, but man, I really, really enjoyed that. And uh, definitely good to have him as a part of the speed street neighborhood, man. That was awesome. I need to get to one of his shows. I need to get to next time. If he comes to town, oh, I guess he said he's going to the snake pit. So if he does a counter daily after party next year, I got to throw down. <laughs> I mean, look, he did the after party with us this year. We had a great time. Uh, and, and he, I, I like, I, I love to see him perform because he's truly like also like he he's a great performer, but also hilarious at the same time. Like if you know him, so it's 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 quite good.
All right. That was Mac, Mac J. You can follow him just at Mac J on Instagram, M A K J. He's got the blue check mark. He's official. Go check him out. Um, all right, dude. Let's get into our Ricky Trodeway random Indy 500 driver of the week here uh, ahead of race weekend. Absolutely. We went uh, for this week, we decided to go um, very old. I, I don't know why, but we needed to get into the 30s. Uh, we went with the 1939 Indy 500. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, I was not alive. Uh, none of us were alive. Uh, Thank you very, for very, very old. Um, and, uh, Wilbur Shaw won this race. Um, but our random Indy 500 driver is a person who finished fifth in this race, uh, named Babe Stapp, Babe Stapp. And I, I like this guy already. Uh, he's obviously no longer alive. Um, but Elbert Babe Stapp was born in San Antonio, Texas, uh, and was a driver in the 1920s, 30s. And I mean, looks like has had an incredible run. He did how many Indy 500? Wow. He did 1927 to 1940, um, in the Indy 500, which is a lot of races. That is more than me. So, uh, yeah, so there's not a ton on his Wikipedia page. I'm not going to lie, not a ton there. But, uh, but yeah, pretty interesting. There's one interesting stat here. Stapps finishes from 1927 to 1938 rank as the worst 10 race finishing streak in Indy 500 history. <laughs> so, a baby. That a baby. Guy, I tell you what, he, he had a good one, though, in 1939. So he bounced back from that 1938 run. I was going to say he, well, that, that seems crazy to me because in 36, he's, ah, uh, no. Yeah. So look, uh, he oh, finished, it's a finish. I got yeah, it. There we go. So finished 31st and then 1928 finished sixth, but then in 28, 31st, 35th, apparently 23rd, 25th, 24th, 31st, 26th. And then in 1939 came in with a top five. Hey, yeah. you know what? He broke that streak like a, like a mother. He, he hit it in the top five there. Uh, old Babe Stapp. It sounds like, you know, when your girl is like really tired, Babe Stapp. You know? <laughs> You're really pissing off your girl, Stapp. Uh, but he did pass. He was born in San Antonio, Texas, and he did pass away uh, in Indianapolis, Indiana, in September of 1980. He said he was also a member of the infamous 13 Black Cats. I don't know. I'm going to have to look that up. 13. Yeah, I, I didn't know what that was because I don't know what was going on in the 30s, but I assume that it could be interesting. So I didn't <laughs> once, that. once again, somebody's definitely going to know who this is or what this is. Um, here we go. There were the 13 Black Cats were famous stunt and movie flyers that appeared in Howard Hughes's Hell's Angels wow. and other 1920s films. All right. So maybe this guy was better in the air than he was on the ground. <laughs> maybe. Old babe snap. That ain't bad. All right. Yeah. Awesome. There it is. Uh, the 34th random Ricky Trodeway random Indy 500 driver of the week, babe Stapp. Uh, appreciate that, Connor. Cool. So that's our show for this week. It's a, it's a, like I said off the top, phenomenal weekend upcoming. Mid Ohio is one of the best weekends of the year. A great race, a great environment. Hope to see you guys out there. If we see you guys out there in the paddock, uh, walking around the merchandise area, Please give me a shout. Definitely, you're always giving Connor a shout, but we'll love to chat about the pod. We'd we'll love to chat about racing, have some fun. Um, be sure to follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcast. Hit that plus button. Get us in your feed every week. Let's make this a neighborhood. Give us a rating, review. Love seeing those. Love seeing your guys' feedback. And, of course, we're on social media at Speed Street Pod, Instagram, Twitter, at ConnorDaily22, at Joey Molinaro, at Neb underscore not, not law uh for ben producer ben there uh, and we appreciate you guys man so we look forward to seeing you guys this weekend at mid ohio and happy fourth of july everybody be safe